More cameras being released, more press events, and still no invite for me. Oh, maybe one day. But Rusty got invited. Oh, yeah. Sony didn't even have a press event for journalists, but they flew Rusty out to Japan, especially to go and test out the A6600, and the Saki Git has spent the day sending me pictures of him trying it. No, 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 you've, you've ruined the, you've ruined the illusion now. So it's been a bit of a busy week for camera announcements. We've had Panasonic officially release the S1H, which was announced a few weeks ago. We've had Canon officially release the 90D and M6 Mark II that were leaked a few days ago. And now Sony have joined the fray with two new APS-C mirrorless cameras of their own. The two cameras basically flank the existing A6400. We have the 6100, which is their new entry-level camera, and the 6600 is replacing the 6500 as a flagship camera. And the thing is that while both cameras look pretty good, they're also kind of meh. Maybe we've just become accustomed in recent years to Sony always bringing out really new exciting tech and these seem a little bit lackluster. Half expected from the 6100 because it's an entry level, so it's a watered down version of the 6400. Essentially, it's the A6400 with a slightly worse viewfinder, no picture profiles, and $150 off. The 6600 marries the best bits of the 65 to the best bits of the 6400 and then makes them a little bit better again. Now this A6500 isn't actually mine, it's my dad's, I just happened to borrow it quite a lot. And when he was looking at buying this, he was torn between the 65 and the 64. And the general consensus at the time was that for still shooting, the 6500 is better. For video, the 6400 is better. Now, he only uses it for stills, which is why he went for the 65. The 6400 has the flip-up screen, more picture profiles because it's got HLG, and better autofocus options because it has the real-time tracking as well, whereas the 6500 has IBIS. The 6600 has the IBIS of the 65, the flip-up screen, and the picture profiles of the 64, but more importantly, does away with the shit FW50 batteries, and instead replaces it with the FZ100s that are found in the A7 and A9 series, which means not only do we get better battery life, you also get a slightly better grip, which will suit the people who say that this is too small. But there's nothing really new, and if you compare up the 61, the 64, and the 66, there's more similarities than there are differences. They all share the exact same sensor, they all have the same shooting speeds, they have fundamentally the same autofocus systems. The 66 is basically the 6400 with IBIS and a better battery, and the 6100 is just a slightly watered down version of the 64, but there's not really a huge amount to pick between any of them. The 6100 certainly makes for a good entry level camera, particularly if you're more focused on stills than video. For someone who wants a slightly better video features than the 6400 suit, and someone who wants an all-round singular camera, then the 6600 is an appealing option. But at $1,400 for a secondary camera, for what I would use it for, it's a little bit too steep. In my position, if I was going to stop borrowing this, I would likely replace it with the 6400 because I'm not too fussed about having IBIS. The bigger news of the Sony announcements for me is the two new APS-C lenses that came with it. Now, one of the lenses, the 70 to 350 millimeters, a little bit of another really do we need it kind of lens. Because yes, it's an APS-C E-mount lens, but Sony already have the 70 to 300 millimeter for full frame. Yes, it doesn't have the extra 50 millimeter on the long end, but when you're dealing with that sort of longer focal range, that that difference is kind of small then you've got the aperture the new 350 millimeter maxes out at f6.3 whereas the 70 to 300 full frame length maxes out of 5.6 so you get that little bit more light as well but really the two lenses don't seem all that different and especially in price the 70 to 300 full frame lens is around about a thousand dollars but the new aps-c lens is about nine hundred dollars 
And you might think, okay, well, I'm on an APS-C camera at the minute, so I'll get the APS-C lens because it's got 50 mil longer focal range and $100 less. Very true, but then that kind of limits you to sticking with APS-C unless you're going to change the lens as well. With the 70 to 300, you have the option that if further down the line you're going to consider switching to a full frame setup, you already have that lens available. The more interesting lens for me is the 16 to 55 f2.8. Now this on an APS-C equates to around about 24 to 80 something mil, so covers the general purpose focal range extremely well. But it is about $1,400 straight out of the box, which means that for an A6600 with a 16 to 55 equals about $2,800. Well, for less than that, you could buy the Sony a7 III with either the Sony 24-70 f4 or the Tamron 28-75, and that would give you arguably the same, if not better, results. Okay, granted, you wouldn't have the flip-up screen and the camera would be slightly bigger, but hey, swings and roundabouts. The $1,400 price tag does seem quite steep, but in fairness, all of Sony's recent lenses, both their G Master, the G Series, and even non-G lenses for that matter, have all received extremely positive reviews. So I guarantee that the price might be quite steep, but there is at least the quality there to back it up. The bigger news for me as to why I think these announcements are really positive isn't so much the announcements themselves, it's the message of intent from Sony that they are taking their APS-C lineup seriously. It's not just the full frame, they are focused on the APS-C as well. And this is something that Canon have been criticised for in recent years. And that's almost cemented by their recent announcements as well. 90D, M6 Mark II, no new lenses. All their lens focus at the moment seems to be on the full frame RF lenses, which are only for the RF system. They aren't usable on any APS-C cameras at the moment. I've seen people asking for the last couple of years for a replacement to the EFS 17-55, an updated version, and or a ESM equivalent to that as a better kit lens than the 18-55. And so far, Canon have released nothing close, not even announcements of intent for doing that sort of thing. And it does leave people in limbo sitting around thinking, are Canon ever actually going to do it? Or am I just waiting around for nothing to happen? And that's where a lot of people then get annoyed and switch to other manufacturers. Now, on to the announcement of the 90D and the M6 Mark II. I did do a video talking about the leaked specs a week or so ago. I did have some people come up with the traditional, oh, you're just hating on Canon, why are you always hating on Canon, just because you say one bad thing about them. Sorry if I'm not going to blow smoke up their ass. Maybe you missed the point where I said that I think they would be very capable stills cameras, and lo and behold, they do seem to be. They're kind of on par with the likes of the competition from Sony. They've got fairly fast shooting speeds, pretty decent autofocus. There are some aspects that aren't quite as good, although people will say they have the Canon Color Science, which a lot of people proclaim is just complete crap, and in blind tests, people actually don't like the Canon colors. But hey-ho! Where the issues of Canon cameras comes in is more for video, and I respect a lot of people aren't shooting video with cameras, a lot of people couldn't give a rat about video features, but likewise there are a lot of people that do. And this is where Canon have gone a little bit crazy. It seems they always take one step forward and then two steps back, which is ironic considering it was them that spearheaded putting video into cameras in the first place. But now they've just gone loopy. The last couple of camera releases, the question was always, is the 4K going to be cropped? Are we going to have full sensor readout? Is it going to be that ridiculous crop? Because for ages, the full frame cameras crop in to look like APS-C, and their APS-C crop in to look worse than Micro Four Thirds. And it does make shooting in 4K quite difficult, particularly if you shoot a mix of 4K and 1080, because then you're having to recompose all the time. Well, Canon have finally got their shit together and have given people full sensor readout for 4K. Great. But they've also cemented the idea now that they've completely dropped 24p. Now, 24p for me isn't much of an issue because I don't shoot in 24p. I always film in 25. 
but there are a lot of people out there that do shoot in 24p and the notion of getting rid of 24p from their cameras when they've had it in the past is just ridiculous doesn't take any additional hardware to do it the capability is clearly in the camera because it can shoot at 30. not having 24p is solely down to software design they could put it in they could easily put it in they've decided not to and i have no idea why they would choose that and now canon have also finally got round to putting full hd 120 frames a second in a more low-end camera but it doesn't have autofocus or sound recording. Because that's useful. Again, ridiculous given that Canon have been able to do 120 FPS since the 1DX Mark II a few years ago. And competition have had 120 FPS in Full HD in their cameras for at least three years now. And here's Canon probably thinking, people keep asking for 120 FPS Full HD. We'll put it in. Hang on, did they specify they wanted autofocus and sound recording? Well, it wasn't mentioned, so we'll only presume no. I mean, maybe Canon are intentionally doing this because they know Camera Conspiracy is going to do a board meeting about them. Maybe they're just feeding him the ammunition, I don't know. But the 120 slow-mo is generally good for slow-mos of fast action. Fast action inherently moves. You try manually focusing fast action and keeping it consistently in focus. Fat chance. So it seems Canon is still on the same road. From a stills perspective, their cameras are still extremely capable. They still have video features that will allow you to shoot video, but they're still insisting on sitting behind the competition in terms of the amount of features that they offer. Now, if you're not wanting the features that are missing from these cameras, then it's kind of irrelevant. But there are a lot of people out there that do want these features. And the more features you restrict, the more people you cut away from your potential customer base. And those people will end up moving away from you. That's just basic consumerism. But the weirdest part of the whole 90D and M6 Mark II release for me is I was watching DP Review TV's review of them yesterday. And the conclusion that they come up with... If you want a camera primarily aimed at stills, you buy the M6 Mark II. If you want the camera more for shooting video, you buy the 90D. Even though when you're shooting video, the 90D flips the mirror up and essentially becomes an oversized mirrorless camera. But anyway, in conclusion, are we now seeing a start of a new cycle? Are these releases from Sony what the market needed, or are Sony turning into canon of just recycling stuff they've already got, making a few tweaks and just filling gaps in the market? And Christ knows what road canon are going down. But what do you make of them all? Leave your thoughts and comments in the box down below. Thank you so much for stopping by, and hopefully I'll see you in the next video.